Tonight's our sixth uh, session uh, telling the uh, prophetic uh, history, and uh, we're in a 12-night uh, uh, period where we're looking at uh, an hour every night, and I'm going to begin with Isaiah chapter 30, and, I, and, and session 5 last night, and session 6 tonight go together. I'm really finishing the story that I started last night, and uh, it's really the nature of our mission and the, nat- and the nature of our mandate in preaching. Uh, it's two evenings, uh, and it's going to be hard to, to get all this in tonight, so I'm going to have to leave out details because I really want to just get it in on these two sessions. and not, uh, I just have so many more uh, things to cover in the remaining six sessions, uh, so I'm going to skip some of the, the details. But uh, it's the nature of our message and our mandate. It's, it's related to the preaching and the singing, and it's... And how it relates to intercession, anointed intercession, and conviction of sin, and the magnitude of the harvest, etc. Now, in Isaiah chapter 30, a verse that I just grew up on in the Lord uh, in terms of intercession, the Lord called me to intercession in a very, very uh, definitive, clear way in May of 1979, and gave me Isaiah 62 and Luke 18. I've I've shared that over and over. Those are my two lifelong passages of intercession. But if I had to pick a third one, I would pick, it would be Isaiah 30. And I preached on Isaiah 30, verse 18 and on, so many times in the early days, 79, 80, 81, 82, 83. And I want to reference it because the, one of the promises of this passage that I remember that uh, I, I was so, uh, so gripped by all those early years, and now I've looked back, and, uh, and, and one of the promises of this passage is really what's happening in these days. Verse 18, I won't really develop it, it, but it's really the call of prayer. Verse 18, therefore the Lord will wait. And uh, the new, uh, I mean the uh, New American Standard, what I uh, uh, learned this on years ago, the Lord longs to be gracious. He's longing to give grace to people. Verse 19 in the middle. He will be gracious. When he hears the sound of your cry, when he hears it, he will answer. And that's the two points I used to make is that God longs, he desires to give grace to the planet. He longs to. It says here in New King James, he waits, but I like the New American Standard. He's longing, but verse 19 in the middle, he's waiting until he hears the sound of the cry of the houses of prayer in the earth. When he hears the sound of the cry, then he'll do it. And there's so many dynamic things. I'm going to skip it. I'm just going to get to one promise. And I remember in those days I used to preach this and I didn't have much understanding. And now it's 20 years plus later. And it's it's so much of it's coming to pass. It says this, verse 21. Your ears shall hear a word behind you saying, this is the way, walk in it. When you turn to the right or the left. Or when you turn uh, well to the right or the left. And here's what that verse means. And that's what the story I'm going to tell you tonight, which is really the prophetic testimonies I've been giving you the five nights before tonight. Here we are walking down a path. Before we've even inquired, the word comes behind us in time. It comes before us. This is what I am going to have you do. And then the next couple steps in the journey, we stumble into it. And uh, what God has promised is to link this prophetic unction, this, this uh, uh, it's like a preemptive strike of the grace of God. And because so many of the stories I'm going to tell you, before we thought of ideas, God spoke them, and then we said, myself and those that were around said, that's a great idea. And it, it was exactly opposite of what I was used to. Normally, we would get an idea and storm the gates of heaven and just... Wear ourselves out, pounding on the door. Will you, will you? And sometimes the Lord in grace said, yeah, I'll open it. And other times he said, no. But it was a very different dynamic when I began to touch the prophetic anointing when I came to the city. The word was behind me. Before I had the idea, it was spoken audibly. And series of circumstances fell into line. And just today as I was meditating on this, this verse kept coming back to me over and over. And the Lord was... Uh, uh, just the way that uh, he makes the word fill your being, it's not like he said it, but I know it was him uh, leading it, saying, have I not been faithful to you? You preached this for these many years, and look, look at your story, because I spend all the, you know, every day in the mornings in this uh, 12-day period reviewing what I said is I have four feet 
literally, I stacked it up, thank you, Jane, thank you, Jeff, four feet of manuscripts and, and data and documentation of all the things that happened. As I've been going through this, I haven't even got through half of it, and I'm looking at it going, Lord, you, you did, you're doing, you did, you're doing, you did what you said. The word came from behind us and said, this is the way. And beloved, this is a promise that we've seen for 20 years, not certainly on every, uh, every need we've had, but this is something that I'm expecting the Lord to multiply times 10 in the days ahead, all over the body of Christ. This idea is that he speaks it. It's a preemptive strike in the grace of God. And he does it in context of verse 18 and 19 to the people who are saying yes to the grace of fasting and prayer. Okay. Last night, I joined together two verses. I want to give a quick review because I want to tie it into tonight. I uh, started with John 16, verse 8, where Jesus promised Holy Spirit conviction. I used the example of David Brainerd and Charles Finney and John Wesley and Jonathan Edwards and George Whitfield, some of the uh, fathers of the days of old and how the power of God broke in and how it's going to break in. And, and my point was, I want to see a whole army of young people and and uh, more than young people, but an army of young people all over the earth who get a vision for apostolic preaching that has power in it, that cuts like a sword through the most uh, most uh, resistant, rebellious heart, because we've seen so little of it in this last uh, uh, generation that we don't have a vision for it. But the fathers from the days of old, some of them operated in this, and it is stunning, and I want to see you get a vision for this that you'll never let go of. But it's not enough to get a vision for this Holy Spirit supernatural preaching. There's another Holy Spirit power, Romans 8.26, uh, which I commented on uh, last night, where the Holy Spirit uh, helps us in our weakness, in our human weakness. He helps us in prayer supernaturally by releasing groanings, too deep for words. Holy Spirit power in prayer, Holy Spirit power in preaching. This is what we're going for. We're positioning ourselves before the grace of God with fasting prayer, with 100% obedience, a big yes in our spirit, and we're waiting, we're persevering in the grace of fasting and prayer and a yes in our spirit. We want anointed prayer and anointed preaching. We're not going to let go of the horns of the altar till we get both of these. Because the anointed groans, the anointed intercession is as much a gift of God as that which flows out of it, the anointed preaching. And I gave some stories about that last night. Uh, I basically gave two testimonies highlighting this reality. Uh, I gave the Easter 1983 when the bottom line word was 1,000 times this power. 1,000 times greater the power is going to be released upon this this youth movement that's going to rise up. And it was a then a half-hour story, so obviously I can't go into it again. And then uh, the second uh, a prophetic testimony I gave last night was uh, uh, the Lord said audibly, Noel is coming, and Noel came, and, and he stood before that valley of flowers in Colorado Springs, which I think is really, real significant. I believe that's really one of the hot spots that God has chosen for prayer and birthing the message of prayer to the nations of the earth. And uh, he was there. And he, he looked out at the valley and the natural, and then you know the story. He, he met Bob Jones uh, five years later, whatever. I think I said that, uh, yeah, he did it in 1979. And uh, he met Bob Jones in 84, and I told the story, and Bob Jones, the very first, the moment he met him, he said, you were one that God said in the valley. And the point of that, as I mentioned last night, is that that's the number of souls. I mean, how, I mean it, we're talking about a mountain valley of miles and miles and miles. He said, that's the, the number, that's the magnitude of souls that you're going to be involved in touching through intercession. That's what the Lord told Noel uh, in Colorado Springs. And five years later, that's what the Lord spoke to Bob Jones the, the moment he met Noel. And, uh, and it was such a holy occasion. And then Noel's, Noel's not a man that has uh, open visions, but he's had one or two in his years. And, uh, I mean, literally a very small number, but they're very precious and they're very dear to him. He had one open vision in the early days in 1984. He saw like a, a, a like a, a, a open vision right before him. He said that the Lord told him this, and the days are coming in this city where there will be 7,000 converts a week coming as the fruit of night and day prayer. 7,000 converts will come in week after week after week after week after week, and there will seem to be no end to it. They will come from the city. They will come from the nation. 
there will be a release of the fountain of grace and they will come and, and uh, multitudes will be getting saved on a weekly basis. Now, I'm looking forward for some uh, times for a bigger harvest than that in the course of a week. But, and, I, and I know this thing is going to happen in other cities of the earth, but the Lord tied it to him related to the night and day prayer that's going to go forth in this city. And that's something I've lived with that reality all of my days. Okay, now we're going to some new testimonies uh, now. It's the same uh, idea. I want to I wanna underscore the connection of Holy Spirit power in prayer to the magnitude and the power of evangelism and the numbers that are going to be saved. This was, uh, I had three experiences with uh, the Lord that the Lord used Bob Jones in. It's just amazing how the Lord used him so much and uh, in those early days in my life helping. Again, now some of you are thinking it's about me. No, it's not. It's about the movement. It's not about me. If, if there was not a movement that God was wanting to form in those early days around Joel 2 and Daniel 9, if there was not a movement, there would not have been the prophetic activity. So don't... Don't uh, uh, go out of here and thinking, well, I, I want to start a ministry and I want to get some, all that stuff happening. And I think the Lord's, he may do that to some of you, but the answer might be, well, I've, I'm setting this thing in motion and I don't need to set it in motion eight times. I've set it in motion and it's a worldwide movement. And I know that there will be many movements in the earth and, and they will all have their prophetic histories and their beginnings and their initiative. But if God's put you a part of this, probably you're not going to have the same magnitude of words for the movement because the movement's been going for some 20, 25 years in the heart of God as he's been speaking it. And so these are the forming ideas of it. And, and they're not happening at, anymore at this kind of level. They're happening for different subjects, but not in the formative ways. And these are f- words that formed our DNA. They formed our genetic. And so don't feel bad if you're not seeing those happen, because uh, I think the Lord's saying, I've put the DNA in very sovereignly. It's sovereignly set in. So here it is. It, so three experience in, in uh, July 1988. It was a Saturday night. Now, typically, I was at the Saturday night prayer meeting, because we had the meeting, pr- prayer meetings every night. And, uh, but this one time, I, for a particular reason, I'm down in the inner city witnessing. I'm by myself. It was just a real clear one, only time I ever did it, to be honest. So it's not like, uh, I wish I did it more, but, uh, it just didn't. I, okay, one time. So I'm down there. Bob Jones is meeting with about a hundred young adults in a Bible study. And, uh, they met every Saturday night and he's the guest speaker and he comes in. And he goes, well, he goes, tonight's going to be a big night for Mike. He goes, wherever he's at. Uh, no one knew where I was, and uh, I had a divine appointment with somebody down there and got to lead someone to the Lord. It was just a, a, a wonderful experience. He says, here's what's going to happen to Mike. He's gonna, an angel's going to visit him tonight. Now, Bob's saying this about 8 o'clock, and I'm down there, and it happens at about 2.30 in the morning. But he says he's going to receive a visitation from an angel tonight, and God's going to give him a promise about souls. And God's uh, going to give him this promise about the end time harvest from the book of John. And he said, I just thought you guys would want to know. He says, he doesn't know yet. He goes, I just thought you'd want to know. And, of course, they're really going for it and having a great time. So I don't hear anything. You know, I get back home about midnight, and, and I'm just feeling all great because this guy got touched, and it was just a divine setup, and... And uh, uh, I missed the Saturday night prayer meeting. I don't care because I'm going to do the will of God. And so here I'm, I'm at home, and it's midnight. I go to bed. Okay, then at 2.30 in the morning, 2.30 in the morning, I am suddenly awakened. Suddenly. Now, I don't want to give a lot of time on this because I think I'll spend more time on the other sessions because i got about four stories like this, uh, prophetic stories. When the Lord suddenly wakes, when you're suddenly awakened and the Spirit of God's resting on you, uh, it's, uh, you ought to ask the question, is there an angel involved? I'm not saying it is every time, but the four or five times I've experienced that, it was undoubtedly there's an angel involved. I'm not saying it has to be that way every time, but I'm talking about dead sleep to where you're instantly wide awake and instantly under the anointing of the Holy Spirit. I mean, within a second and a half, I'm talking. And, uh, I mean, normally my style, wake up, three cups of coffee, even that can't get me anointed, you know, and it takes me a while and... Put on my music. That didn't work. And it, it, so here it is, 2.30 in the morning. I'm in bed. I'm suddenly awakened. And, I mean, this was startling. I was, so I went and I uh, sat in our living room. And so it takes about five seconds to get to the living room. I'm on the couch sitting there. 
with the presence of God clearly resting on me, and I have no idea what's going to happen next, I begin, without a moment's notice, without a thought of anything, I begin to sob in travailing prayer for the harvest of Kansas City. And I am, I'm in one of these things I told you the other day. I've told you about every time that's ever happened to me nearly. And I am in full-scale Holy Spirit travail at the 32nd mark from a dead sleep. Now, I don't know what's going on. And I am gripped. And this goes on and on. I, I mean, maybe an hour. I don't mean for five hours, but... You know, and I'm, you know, I had that thing with Bob Jones Easter. You know, I'm a little gun shy. I don't know if I'm being set up or what. And I'm travailing for the harvest and the Holy Spirit speaks to me. He goes, he says, I am going to release the anointing of prayer. He did it sovereignly. I mean, I was in my sleep. And, uh, and you, we could use that uh, figuratively speaking. Many of us found our way to this place basically spiritually asleep. I mean, yes, there had to be something going on for us to get here, but we were all distracted by this, that, and the other. And if the truth be known, we kind of landed here, kind of going, now, how did I get here? I mean, I said yes, but I, didn't, I don't even know what I did here. If the truth be known, that's probably the majority of you. Here's what the Lord says. He goes, I am going to supernaturally anoint you in prayer, and I'm going to keep my promise to release the harvest to you. I'm going to keep my promise uh, to release it. Now, the promise, remember, was the thousandfold from the Easter 83. The promise was Noel and the, the millions, I guess, of lilies in that field. I guess millions. That was a promise, the 7,000 a week, and I'm aware of this. And uh, the Lord speaks to me, uh, John, the verse of John 6, 44 and uh, I didn't have Song of Solomon operating in me, so the Lord used language I knew. I will draw them. It's really Song of Solomon 1.4. I will draw you after me and they'll run. I didn't have that language yet, so he used the language I did know. Uh, John 6.44, and I opened it up, and the Lord says, I will draw them. I will draw them. And he, was, and he said, I'm going to draw the intercessors into the anointing, and I'm going to draw the harvest in numbers you can't imagine. I, am, I can't even imagine what's happening. Because this is so clear and so powerful. So then the next morning, you know, I, I, I uh, uh, get up because it's a Saturday night, Sunday morning. I said, John, chapter 6. And, of course, Bob Jones said, tomorrow, uh, on, on Saturday night, he said, tomorrow morning, Mike's going to preach on the Gospel of John somewhere about intercession and the harvest because he's going to get an angel visitation, but he won't even know it's an angel. He's just going to know he was stirred up suddenly and in the power of God. And I got up there and I said, you know, I don't really know what happened last night. But uh, I was sound asleep, and the Lord promised me he would give an anointing as effortless to this prayer uh, ministry that's going to happen as he did to me. I was in my sleep. I mean, I wasn't like straining and groaning to get anointed. I was asleep. And suddenly I'm in it, and I said, that's the kind of free gift that's going to fall on the, on, on, the, on the church of Jesus in this city that's saying yes to the spirit of grace and supplication. It's going to be effortless when it comes. Let's just keep ourselves in the way of it. And then the harvest, I promise you, he's going to release the harvest. And, uh, and of course, scores of these young adults came up. We knew, we know what you don't know, you know. And I said, what? Just one after the other. I go, okay, what is going on here? And, uh, uh, of course, Bob then came and they all gathered around. He said, I told them last night an angel would visit you. He'd give you a promise about the harvest. But the promise wasn't just the magnitude of it. The promise was the, the free gift of the anointing of groaning travail that is necessary to release it. The gift of travail would come as well. The Lord is delights in parables. You know, the Lord's a poet. And uh, one, uh, Bob's in, uh, you know, I say, was it a dream? He goes, no, it wasn't a dream. And I, he used to say this all the time. And those of you that know him can picture him. I said, well, what was it? Was it a vision? He goes, no. I said, well, what was it then? He said, I was there. And I said, well, you were where? And he goes, when you go there, you'll know where it's at. He used to always say, <laughs> he says, when you're there, you'll know. He goes, I don't know, but it's no dream that I was there. Terry, you know a little bit about that, eh? <laughs> and so uh, I, he used to always say that. So he was there uh, on this one. Because I said, was this a dream? He goes, no, I was there. I tell you, I was there. And uh, what happened, this uh, underscores the magnitude of the harvest and its link not to intercessory prayer, but to intercessory giving, the spirit of generosity on giving. This is really quite stunning. Bob uh, uh, is, is in this uh, bus. And, and uh, the bus is this movement. 
that he always talked about this movement that was going to come. And Jesus is driving the bus, and Jesus is going real fast downhill, and he was going on curves, and everybody observing says, they're going off the cliff, they're going off the cliff, but Jesus is driving the bus, and Bob says, you're not going to go off the cliff. And then he would go real slow uphill, and all the people would say, all the people on the bus, the people on the outside were criticizing it was too reckless going down, and the people on the inside were complaining it was too slow going up. And he said, it will, it will, uh, the accusers will have plenty of accusations, and the participants will have plenty of tried patience when it's all said and done. He says, uh, uh, but Jesus was driving the bus. And it's not going off the cliff. He's leading it. And, and, and uh, this was such a, uh, an interesting thing that, that uh, Bob said. And uh, he said, let me tell you something, Mike, about the way the Lord drives the bus, the way that he leads his people. He goes, that young man, he called him that uh, because he saw him as a young man, you know, 30 years old, in the, like 30 years old-ish. And he said, that young man has the strangest ideas and the strangest leadership that you could imagine. He says, there's hardly anybody that would agree with him if they really knew what he was doing. If they really knew what he was doing, almost any leadership group would vote it out if they knew all the information on the front end. He says, they wouldn't go down that bus ride and they wouldn't go real slow up the hill either. They would go slow down the hill and fast up the hill. They do it exactly opposite. He goes, like for instance you, all of you guys, you always plan to go slow down the hill and fast up the hill. He does it exactly opposite. And he went on and on. So, now, so the Lord parks and says, looks behind and says, I'm steering the bus. You're not going over the cliff, no matter what your accusers say. And then the Lord turns around and gives $1,000 to Noel Alexander sitting in the front seat. I mean, right there behind him. And the first pastor gives him $1,000. And the Lord tells him this, so that, sow this money into the harvest, and I'm going to multiply it. I will multiply it a thousandfold. I'll give you a thousand. If you sow it in the harvest, I will multiply it a thousand. And so Noel in the dream, in the whatever, or somebody, Bob or Noel or somebody said, that's a million dollars. And uh, the Lord said, this is a token of the future prosperity I'm going to release in the days to come, if you will continue to trust me. This is only a token of what I will release. And then the Lord spoke and said, now... Take the million and sow the million back into the harvest. Sow the million back into the harvest. And I will release a million souls as you sow this. And then he said, and that million souls is only a token of a thousandfold more, the billion I'm going to release. So it's got all this very interesting language and numbers to it. So there's a thousand dollars handed to know. And the Lord says, if you will sow in the harvest, I'll multiply it and give you a million to sow. If you sow the million dollars, I'll release a million souls. That will be a down payment of a million times a thousand, a billion souls coming forth. And I'm going to release it through night and day prayer. So then uh, the Lord looks at Bob right in the face. He says, I'm going to confirm it today. A millionaire will call you. So Bob uh, comes out of this, uh, this uh, uh, spiritual experience and He's just bewildered. He's thinking a million, a thousand, or what? He's, he says, wow. And so he's out in the morning, and he's digging in his garden. And Bob's lived in this house, I'm guessing 10 or 20 years. I don't really know, but some many years. He's got this little garden about 10 by 10. I, you know, I said, Bob, that's not really a garden. But anyway, it was his garden. And he was digging in it, and he dug a little deeper than normal, and he hit a piece of metal about two or three feet down. He said he was some, for some reason, he's going deeper than he normally does. And he, and he thinks it's a rock, so he digs around it. He pulls up. It's a bus. It's a cast iron bus. And there were seven windows in, in this bus in his dream, and he saw seven of our leaders, and there were seven uh, windows in this cast iron bus. I mean, a, he goes, this is unbelievable. This is unbelievable. He has a cast iron bus totally filled with rust, about a foot Long, maybe, maybe four or five inches wide. I mean, a big old heavy cast iron bus from way back when. Who knows? Bob is, Bob's excited. Now, this is odd to me. You know, I've never had a dream about a bus and dug up a bus. So, Bob goes in and he gets the phone call of a lifetime. I, I mean, not, not the most important one, but the strangest one. He's sitting at his home. 
Now, this is verified. He, this is a, a prophet from the hills of Arkansas that didn't really uh, get much past high school, if then. And uh, he's at home. And John DeLorean, the famous car manufacturer, whatever he is, all the fancy cars way back in, the older ones will know, calls Bob on the phone from New York. Hello, is this Bob Jones? Yes. This is John DeLorean from New York. Are you the man that spoke this word on a tape? And, and Bob says, John DeLorean. He says, well, you're the millionaire. He goes, well, y- y- well, yeah, I'll, I mean, uh, could I uh, meet you? I have some things. I, and he had a dinner with him and met him. So the millionaire calls him. So Bob, we have a staff meeting that day. Bob is so blown away by this. He comes walking in with this big old ugly 10-inch, 12-inch by 4, 5 or 10-pound, whatever it is, piece of dirt rust bus. It's all dirty. Now he's really fixed it up real fancy. And da, da, da. I mean, he, he sent it into some shop, and they did something real nice to it. But he brings it in, and we're at the staff meeting. Okay, there's maybe 50 of us there. I said, Bob, what are you doing? Is this like show and tell today? It's like, I go, what, what are you doing? He says, I'll tell, you when, well, I'll tell you when I'm good and ready. I'll tell you when I'm good and ready. I go, what on earth? So we get it going. Everybody's looking at that. He's sitting on the front row shaking his head. And I said, okay, let's just get the drama over. What is going on? So he gets up and he goes, this bus. He said, God visited me. He said, and we're not going off the cliff. I don't care what anyone says. And don't bail because it goes up the hill slow either. Have perseverance. And so we're all going, okay, okay. And he said, the Lord turned around and gave Noel a thousand dollars. He says, no. He said, uh, uh, you're supposed to sow it in the harvest. I, just be ready for it. Noel says, you're not going to believe this. At two o'clock this afternoon, I went and opened the mail. I had a thousand dollar check from the U.S. government. Now he's South African. He goes, I have no comprehension why I have a thousand dollar check from the U.S. government. Exactly. 1,000, zero, zero. He goes, not 909. He goes, I have no idea what this is about. Me and my wife are mystified. And Noel says, and Bob says, well, I think it's really clear what you're supposed to do with this. And so Noel gave it away to the harvest. Okay, now. So, four things, were, or five things, whatever were spoken. The bus, he finds it. The millionaire, he calls him. I verify it later. He has dinner with the guy, you know. I, although I believe Bob, but I just went ahead and just go ahead, went ahead and found out, you know, let everything be confirmed by two witnesses. He really called him. I just said, this is incredible. Noel said, I really got the $1,000 at 2 o'clock today. I have no idea where. So now a year goes by. No, two years. A year and a half. Because it's, no, two years. Uh, July 88. Now it's July 90. Two years. Now, the Soviet Union has let its walls go down, right? In November 89. And so Bob comes to me. And he said, no, at our staff meeting. He goes, no, did you give that $1,000 away? He says, yeah, did you give the harvest? He goes, yeah. He goes, you know what the Lord's going to do? He said, that was a token of the prosperity that's going to hit this movement. He says, God's going to give you the power at this conference to give a million dollars. He says, no, gave a 1000 God's going to multiply it times a 1000 You're going to take a million-dollar offering. He says, no, you gave it to the harvest. We're going to give this million to the harvest. And it's going to be a down payment of a billion because God's going to multiply that times a thousand too, the number of getting saved. Now, the bus, John DeLorean, no with a thousand, that was pretty unusual. And but, but at the staff meeting, everybody's in a great mood. Yeah, all the million dollars. Now the conference comes. Bob says, get up and take the million. He says, you can't be in unbelief. He goes, we found the bus because that was a token of the Lord. He goes, I go, well, there's a bus in your garden. And he goes, John DeLorean, the millionaire, called me. I said I was. Yeah, but he heard a tape. No got the $1,000. The U.S. government's confused. I said, I, I can think of lots of reasons why. <laughs> because everybody on the staff a month or eight weeks later was all excited. Now the conference is there. And they're saying, tell them they're going to give a million dollars. Proclaim it. Prophesy it. I said, what? Well, that's kind of a big offering, Bob. He said, you do it. And I said, can I inch my little self towards it and say, hey, Why don't we just really give extravagantly? Well, anyway, I did what I did. I I didn't quite say it. I just couldn't quite say it will come. And they took the offering. 
uh, at that conference, our summer conference, we got $1.1 million in the offering. It was shocking. It was shocking. They had, what, five, six, seven, eight tables across the whole front. They, they have pictures where it was stacked up like maybe a foot or two. It was a morning offering. It was a Thursday morning offering. It was just a normal offering. I said, let's do it. And Bob says, we're in a wind of the Holy Spirit. This is not about you. This is about supernatural prosperity. This isn't even about your faith. This is about if you will do what God says. He says, and the reason that he had no there, because this harvest is going to be released economically through economics, intercession and economics, and intercession through prayer. And Noel is such a picture of an intercessor. He goes, it's, this, it's, it's going to be a movement loosing the harvest through night and day prayer, and it's going to have extravagant giving to the poor at the very center of it. And beloved, I took that little offering. I inched my way forward. I didn't make any big faith statements. And the Lord says, I'm bigger than you because you're just a little guy, you don't quite understand what's going on, and we received $1.1 million. It was staggering to me that this took place. And of course, what did we do? We gave 100% of it to the harvest in Russia, 100% of it, and but the Lord told, everything else was true. The Lord said, told Bob Jones, I mean, two years earlier, he goes, when you sow that million, I'll give you the million as a token of supernatural prosperity for the harvest. You sow it, there'll be a million souls come out of it in Russia. Of course, there's no way we can tell. We gave the million. We bought Bibles because they'd been in prison and they, didn't, they had very few Bibles in the land. We bought a million dollars of the Bibles. We ended up getting, at the end of the day, I think we got them for 60 cents a piece from China We got because they were going to be 90 cents. We got, I mean, because the difference between 90 and 60 is big when you're getting a million. And we ended up 60 shipped. 62 cents, some incredible number, and we gave them to the apostolic leaders from one end to the other, and they sowed Bibles throughout the Soviet Union to all these guys that have been in prison for the gospel. I can only say that the word that was a, a million dollars will result in a million souls, but the other word is, and the Lord says, and I will give a hundred, a thousandfold to that as well. He says, you're going to be involved in a move of God, because it's the whole earth working together, the, the uh, international family of affection, a billion souls are going to come forth in the last days. So that's a little bit of the magnitude of, uh, of, of that. Okay, next, next one about preaching. Moving to the next testimony. It's, it's John 6, the groaning intercession. July 88, it's the million souls, million dollars, billion souls. July 88. It's the Song of Solomon, chapter 8, verse 6. God is shining on the reality of evangelism and prayer and how it works together and, our, and the mandate of this movement because Bob always, he always called it a movement. When we joined the vineyard, I said, Bob, could you tone down the movement language because that sounds like anarchy because we're in a movement. And he said, I don't, I don't know about all that. I just know the movement's still going. He goes, you can do what you do, but I'm calling it a movement because God does. And I said, well, just don't call it a movement around me because it sounds like a slap because we just joined a family. And he says, I, I just don't understand all of that. I'm just going to say what God says, and there you have it. And so we had little, uh, little talks about that for a little while. And uh, he always called it a movement, so there you have it. So uh, July 1988, <clears throat> I'm uh, there in, uh, in the office. I'll give the short version because I've given it so many times. Uh, there I am, and I got a, a, a wedding card. And on the wedding card, it says Song of Solomon 8.6. That's great, you know, uh, you know, the seal on the heart and da-da-da-da. And I go, wow, that's a cool verse. So I opened the Song of Solomon 8, verse 6. Of course, there's not a mark in my Bible on Song of Solomon. And I said, that is a great verse. And I began to pray it in an accurate way, accidentally accurate. I began to pray it as Jesus putting a seal upon my heart. And uh, because in the wedding card, it was about, you know, the husband and wife. And I just said, Lord Jesus, you know, and I, and I went into this prayer. And the Spirit of God began to move on me. I began to weep. I just began to just weep. And I pick up the phone and I tell the, the receptionist, man, the, the Lord's on. It's the only time I've ever done that in 25 years plus of ministry. I picked the phone up and said, something's happening. Something's happening. So it's not like a regular practice that uh, every time I feel something, I pick the phone up. I said, something's going on here. I picked the, put the phone down. Ten minutes later, the phone rings. Uh, hello, uh, you know, I was getting ready to say, I thought that I asked you, and the receptionist says, hello, Mike, I'm sorry, but uh, 
Bob Jones has heard the audible voice of God for you, and I thought you would want God to get in. You know, if, uh, he goes, I just made a, 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 a uh, last-minute call, and I figured you'd want it. I go, yeah, yeah. I, he goes, of course, always let God in, you know. I don't mean Bob Jones, but I mean the word of the Lord in this way. And so I got Bob, and Bob says, I only have literally 90 seconds because he was on his way to the airport. And again, I tell the story in longer, about a 30-minute story in other settings. But Bob says, Mike, here I am on my knees, Song of Solomon, weeping, phone in my hand. He says, the Lord is uh, about to give you your mandate in a very serious way for the rest of your life. He goes, you may not understand it. It's found in Song of Solomon chapter 8, verse 6. I said, this is amazing. He said, this is your mandate all the days of your life. He goes, I don't much understand it. He goes, but I know you will in time. Bob says, I don't really understand it. He says, God says, this is what you're going to do all the days of your life, whatever that verse is about. He goes, and you're, and God's going to call people to it, and he's going to do this in the body of Christ worldwide. He goes, he goes I don't fully understand it, but uh, that's what he's going to do. He goes, I heard it audibly from the Lord. He told me to call you right now, right now. And he goes, I'm literally catching a ride. They're in the front right now in my house, I mean, in the, in the, uh, driveway, and I'm late. I got to go. And he hangs up. And I am looking at Song of Solomon, chapter 8, verse 6. I am absolutely shocked this has happened. And I am so excited. I remember I, I called Diane. I said, Diane, you're not going to believe this. I go, it happened again. I said, uh, Bob Jones heard the audible voice of the Lord. I was reading a verse, Song of Solomon 8, 6. She goes, well, what's that? I go, just give me a minute here. And I said, uh, and the spirit came on me, and I was just weeping over it. And I had some wedding card, and and she and, I, and he called me up and said, "That's my life mandate." And she goes, "Man, that is so exciting." So then it's about uh, nine o'clock in the morning, and so hang up. And then I decide to read it for the first time. I've never read Song of Solomon. I get I read it. I read all eight chapters first time, uh, and I was utterly depressed. I said, "This is not going to work. This this is not possible." And most of you know, my father was a world champion boxer. He was literally world champion. Uh, I grew up in the gym. I grew up in the boxing gym with his ch- uh, boxing champion friends, mafia friends. So I'm telling the Lord, I said, Lord, you know, I'm, you know I, I'll do the life of David. I'll do Book of Revelation. I'll do Book of Romans. I, I can't do this, though. This is not, I'm not built for this. I said, let's give this to the ladies' ministry. They'll love it. But the Lord is setting... I now understand, Bob says, just, he goes, God's going to surprise you. This movement, this is the centerpiece of this movement. I go, no way. There's no way this is going to be true. He goes, no. He told me this is what he's called you to the rest of your life. And this is what he's going to do in the world. Whatever this truth means, uh, because it's not just the verse, it's, it's the truth of intimacy with God at the centerpiece of the prayer movement, the great commission of everything we're doing. So I'll go Solomon 8.6. That's such a critical part. I hate uh, just running by that story so fast. Okay, that was in 1988. Then a few years go by, and I, the Lord begins to really awaken my heart to it in a real special way. Then November 1995, November 1995, so what is that, uh, uh, you know... Thank you. Seven years later. Seven years later, on November 95, I have a prophetic dream. And uh, in this dream, it's on a Sunday morning. In this dream, the Lord speaks to me. I'm on a large platform, and this voice comes, which is the voice of the Holy Spirit undoubtedly, this resounding voice like thunder. And the voice says, uh, uh, call them, name them Hephzibah. Name them Hephzibah. It's right from Isaiah chapter 62, verse 4 and 5. And I, I love to say this, that even in my dream, I was going, Hephzibah. I know where that verse is. Even in my dream, I was trying to figure out because I couldn't think where it was. I didn't know what it meant. And I wake up uh, from the dream instantly. Spirit of the Lord's resting on me instantly. is a Holy Spirit swirl Sunday morning. I preach on it that Sunday morning. And, the, and I'm thinking, where is this verse, and I go th- all through Isaiah, I can't find it. I go through Jeremiah. I, I think it's, I know it's not Psalms. I go through Jeremiah, Daniel, because I know Isaiah 62 so well, because my favorite verse is Isaiah 62, 6. God will put watchmen on the wall. That's the verse, that's what he called me to intercession with in 79. Preached on it a thousand times. But I always start night and day prayer, Isaiah 62, ver- verse 6. I always start in verse 6. 
I never read verse 1 to 5. I always, I mean, I preached on this so many times. The first sermon I ever gave at MCF, December 5th, 1982. Isaiah 62, 6. I mean, like clockwork. So when I'm looking for it, I skip Isaiah 62 every time. I know Isaiah 62. And I go on, Jeremiah, and I'm getting desperate because I'm, I'm alive with this. I want to preach it that Sunday morning. God said, call them Hephzibah, which means, and it says it right there in the passage, because the Lord delights in you. Tell the nations, tell the people, I delight in my people. Tell them this. It's the same message as, as Song of Solomon 8.6. And I can't find it anywhere. And then I'm just in despair. I get a concordance and finally concordance. Okay, Isaiah 62? That's not possible. I know Isaiah 62 like I know the names of my children. I know Isaiah 62. I open it up. There it is. Verse 4 and 5. And the Lord speaks to me so clear. He goes, the bridal paradigm of Isaiah 62, verse 1 to 5. It's actually verse 1 to 5, the whole thing. This is critical to the night and day prayer, verse 6 and 7, which is critical to the forerunner ministry of verse 10 to 12. You will never get them into the forerunner ministry of verse 10 to 12 without the prayer night and day of verse 6 and 7, and you will never, ever do this without verses 1 to 5. And I said, oh, my goodness, this is the Song of Solomon, Dylan. I don't connect that moment with it, but later I do. And so the Lord says, speaks to me audibly in this dream. Again, the Lord's behind me speaking. He's saying, I don't know Hephzibah. I don't even think to tell people this. I just think to tell them to do night and day prayer and get with it. He says, tell them I delight in them, and then they will be able to sustain it. Then they'll be able to sustain it. And it was like, I said, Lord, this is... You're a brilliant teacher, Jesus. You're a good leader. This is good. Years later, I, go, years later, I said, Lord, this is such a good way to lead a prayer movement. Who thought of these ideas? These are great ideas. Get them into intimacy and then get them into night and day prayer. And then they're going to be ready to be forerunners. I go, this is brilliant. And then, very significantly, Isaiah 63 is right after that, which is the message of Jesus the judge. And that's, uh, that's something I'm going to get to in just a minute. So that's uh, November 96. Then a year later, I am all excited a year later. You know, it's, a, it's November, uh, that was no- November 95, I mean. Now it's November 96. November 96. I, we have this all-night prayer meeting, and I go there about 10. It's about midnight now, and I'm going until 5 in the morning. And I get caught up in this river of the, of the Lord's presence, and I'm say, I say this one statement I'm, I'm just making this up 10,000 times. I said it all night long, all night long, from, t- from midnight till 5 a.m. I walked back and forth at the MCF auditorium. I could picture right there. For a, and it said, I didn't say to anybody could hear me. I, just, I was prophesying. I just prophesied it to the north and south for five hours. Because every time I said it, I had a surge of his presence. I go, this feels so good. I'm going to do it one more time. And, and I did it, and it went on and on on and on for five hours. And it was this statement. I said, you are so beautiful. To, I was saying it to God. You are so beautiful. You are the beautiful God. I prophesy, church, the beautiful God. Open up your gates. But I was saying it quiet. And it was just a shoo of the spirit. Shoo of the spirit. I was expecting it to go three or four minutes. One hour. If it ain't broke, don't fix it. Do you know two hours? Three hours, I go, I love this. I could do this for a lifetime. If this is what walking with God's about, this is cool. 4 a.m. Every time I go, you are beautiful. Church of Jesus, I prophesy. Open your gates to the beautiful God. Swoosh. I went, whoa. 5 a.m., the prayer meeting's over. I go home, go to bed. I just wake up early. I wake up about 8. I, I'm excited. I want to go. I go back to the church. It's all empty now. No one's there. I'm going to go to the same spot. You never know, you know, who was standing there in the invisible, you know. I went to the same spot. Right up there. I can tell you right where it's at. Anyway, and uh, by the overhead projector. And I went, I started walking. I said, I'm going to try it again. You know, maybe there's an angel there. Maybe the Lord. I don't know. And it went on for two hours again. And I walked back and forth. And I said, beautiful God. Beautiful God. And that was not language I was using yet. I go, this is amazing. I go, this feels good. It, it's, it sounds good. I don't know what else to say. I just beautiful God. I don't even know how to describe his beauty. Just you're beautiful. That's good enough. That's a good beginning point. And then I, uh, a, a lady, uh, a friend, uh, a dear friend from the North uh, part of Kansas city named Cindy Belke 
uh, a couple days later, about a week or so later, whatever, this is the last of November, uh, I opened the mail and says, Dear Mike, Cindy, I had a dream about you on November 30th, the same, the same night. And she said, and in this dream, the Lord said he was going to open up to you the revelation of his beauty, and he wants you to call the church into his beauty. She goes, I know that's a little strange of a dream. And I got a hold of her a couple weeks later. I said, Cindy, you have no idea what that dream means to me. And that November 96, beauty of God, November 95, called them Hephzibah, July 88, Song of Solomon is the centerpiece of this movement, is this idea of the bridal paradigm. It's just a, a massive thing. Okay, I got a couple more minutes, and I got two more stories. And these are very, very important ones. Okay, we're still talking about the preaching mandate, the preaching mandate uh, of this movement. Uh, here, here it is. I have, uh, uh, and I'm just going to tell you this because we're all into this thing together and so it's not a, a real big thing because it's going to be so everywhere in the church of Jesus worldwide. It may seem a little startling on the front end, but 10 years from now, what I'm going to tell you right now is going to be boring. But uh, for a number, for several years, for about three year, two or three years, two years, I fasted every day. I mean, every, uh, every week for three days a week on, on water. I always went from Sunday afternoon to Wednesday afternoon, just for several years in a row. And so the reason I'm telling you that is because I began to understand this. I did that for a couple of years, and the Lord changed it to something a little different than something a little different and uh, whatever. And so the reason I'm saying that to you because there is a connection to fasting and prayer to these kinds of realities. I don't mean you earn them, but you put yourself in a position. So I've been doing this now for a little while, and, and here's what I came to know. It wasn't every week, but Wednesday was a kiss of God day. And it happened so many times on Wednesday, not every Wednesday, you know, out of uh, uh, two years plus, so let's say that's 50 Wednesdays times two years, 100 Wednesdays, say maybe about 125 Wednesdays. Uh, Wednesdays were good. Well, number one, I ate on Wednesday and it was fun and I was happy and, and it was, but I was buzzy in the good way. The Holy Spirit, I loved it. I was weak. I was just, it was a great day of romance. Wednesday was. And I always went to the 6 o'clock prayer meeting, and then we had, an, uh, uh, I think, a 10, yeah, 10 o'clock one, because I went from 6 to, till noon. I just stayed the whole, same chair the whole time, the whole six hours. And I just always read, for a couple of years, just the book of Isaiah. I just read Isaiah, just 40 to 66. I just read it all the time. I loved it. Read it and cry and write. And, oh, I loved it. I was, I was going to eat in a few minutes, you know, and, I mean, at noon. And, and I, my fingers were buzzy because of the fasting, and after, you know, uh, a year of this, there's an accumulated weakness that, that you catch it because you, you never quite recover. But that actually even uh, enhances the fasting dimension in a positive way too. And then you're, you get used to it, your stomach and your system, so you're not hungry. You're weak, but you're not hungry. But Wednesday, uh, like I said, this is going to be a normal thing. I don't mean these three days for everybody, but I want to tell the 20-year-olds again that uh, you don't have to go do that right now, but just say, Lord, give me the grace of fasting because uh, you will be surprised what wind currents you will get on when you say yes to the grace of fasting. I don't mean for a month, but for a number of years. And I was a guy that hated fasting. I'm telling you, I've said this for years. I hated Bible study, personal Bible study. I love meetings. I hated Bible study, prayer, and fasting. I remember I was so burdened when I was 20. I go, I love biographies. I love preaching meetings to hear preaching and the singing. I don't like personal Bible study. It's so boring. It's so confusing. I hate fasting. I couldn't make it past noon ever. I would get till noon, and I would cheat. Start over at 1, you know, in the afternoon. <laughs> I just said, it's just not working. I'm just not a faster. That's just all there is to it. And I didn't like prayer. Prayer was so pathetically boring. I even got upset the Lord once. I said, Lord, why did you invent this? This is a, this is a bad way to run the kingdom. It really is a bad way to run the kingdom. I was upset that the concept of prayer was upsetting to me. It didn't make sense. Why do you want me to sit in a room and tell you what you tell me to tell you all day? It doesn't make any sense. I got to do stuff for you. But anyway, I've, I've changed my position on that. And, uh, Wednesday was always, fun no, no, not always, that's exaggerated. A couple of Wednesdays were like, yeah, really bad. But Wednesdays was the kiss day. And I loved going to bed on Tuesday because I, I got to eat the next day and it was going to be buzzy in the spirit, whatever that means. That's not a theological term. So uh, it just was that feeling. 
How many of you know what I'm talking about? Raise your hand. Yeah, okay, there you go. Most of you do. Okay, so it's, so I have this dream. It's on August 27th, 1994. Oh, oh, I'm forgetting something. Our August conference, I, or it could have been late July, whatever, Rick Joyner was a speaker at it, and Rick uh, uh, met me in the, uh, in the uh, leader's uh, room afterwards, and he said, hey, Mike, he goes, the Lord spoke me a word. He's going to visit you about your, uh, about your commission, about your mandate. He goes, you're in a time of transition. He says, I'm assuming you know that. I go, I, actually, I do know it. He goes, you're in a time of transition, and the Lord in the next weeks is going to visit you and tell you, uh, tell you, you don't even know about that part. He said, uh, uh, you're gonna, uh, he's going to tell you about your commission, about your life direction. He's going to visit you in a very profound way. And I said, wow, cool. So I had that in my mind. So here it is, uh, maybe a month later. It's, all, uh, it's uh, August 27th, 1997. And I have this dream from the Lord. And, uh, and what the, the Lord speaks again, I hear his voice in the, in, the, in the dream. And the Lord says, Isaiah 60, uh, 60, verse 3. You know, that's the verse, holy, 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 the seraphim in Isaiah. You, you know, he sees the Lord high and lifted up and the seraphim cry holy. Isaiah 6, verse 3. He says this, I hear this voice, it's the voice of the Spirit. Isaiah 6, 3 will open up to you in Isaiah 40. Isaiah 6, 3 will open up to you in Isaiah 40. And the Lord tells me my commission is Isaiah 40, verse 3, that I'm going to build up the highways. And you know that verse, you know, that how that goes, you know. And, and so I knew the verse, and uh, I wake up from that, and I love it, okay? That, that, that's August uh, 27th. And I go to the prayer meeting that day from 6 a.m. And I stay in the, the two-hour gap between the next prayer meeting. And I just read Isaiah. And I walk in the door at the 6, I think it was at 6.30. And uh, Rick Moresco, some of you know it. I walk in the door from this dream. And I'm buzzing because, remember, I'm going to eat at noon. And I'm all excited. And I walk in the door. And he's singing the song, Isaiah 6.3. Holy, holy, holy. And all they, all they cry. I went, this is cool. This is going to be a kiss day. I can tell. And so... Uh, Nothing more happens that day. It's a great day, and the hamburger was awesome. But then the next week, the next week, it's Wednesday morning again. Wednesday morning again. No dream, but I, I wake up. I go to the 6, uh, the six o'clock one, and it's, it's uh, September 3rd now. And I'm there, and I'm sitting there the whole six hours from 6 to noon. And, I'm, and I write about 20 pages on Isaiah 40. I'm really into Isaiah 40 after that dream the week before. I know it's Rick Joyner's uh, prophecy to me. You're going to receive your mandate from the Lord, et cetera, et cetera. And so, as I'm reading these uh, Isaiah 60 to 6, 40 to 66, because I, I always read them on Wednesday, I got 20 pages. I'm writing, writing, writing. The Holy Spirit begins to highlight three verses to me. And then he highlights these three verses. Revelation 2.17. Get this down. I wrote these down. Revelation 2.17. It was so clear. Revelation 3.12 and Revelation 19.12. Revelation 217, Revelation 312, and Revelation 1912. They all have to do with God telling you your name and telling you his name. It's all about the name of God. And the Holy Spirit highlights this to me and makes it clear to me this is all about Isaiah 40. I know it's about Isaiah 40 because that's what I'm swirled in every Wednesday. And that's what I've been on for hours. So now I'm sitting here. I've had now, I'm having my it happened four times in 30 years. It's my wind and fire day. I told you that it happened on December 19th, 1976. It hadn't happened since. Here it is, uh, September 3rd, 97. I mean, you know, it's 20 years later. I've never had, maybe I did and can't remember, but here I'm there and the fire and the wind begins to come on me. What I mean by heat, burning heat and cessation of wind going around me. It's on me. I'm writing it down. I'm excited. These are the keys to Isaiah 40, and they're the keys to Isaiah 6.3. Holy, holy, holy. And I'm sitting there, and the wind and the fire's on me. And, uh, meaning heat and a sensation of the Holy Spirit uh, blowing. And, you know, and I'm going, whoa, this is heavy. So the 12 o'clock comes. We got a staff meeting. On the way out the door, way out the door, Michael Sullivan comes and gives me this note. He says, Terry Bennett, who just moved here. You just moved here? He says, Terry Bennett, who's just moved here, Jeff Grismore's good buddy, and uh, who brought him here to Kansas City, and uh, said, had a word from the Lord. He said that he saw wind and fire on you, and he said the Lord was imparting to you. I got it written down here exactly. He says, I saw the wind and fire on you. The Lord was imparting a mantle, and it was going to be related to three verses, Revelation 2.17, 
Revelation 3, 12 and Revelation 19, verse 12. And you're going to be visited by an angel from Revelation chapter 8, verse 1 to 6 or 1 to 5. Now, if you haven't studied those verses, just write them down and maybe in a, one of these days they'll make sense to you. I was absolutely blown away. Here I am completely alive with the Holy Spirit's leading on these three verses, wind and fire, and a, a man, a prophetic anointed man, gives me the three verses. I don't obviously tell nobody. It says the wind and the fire and Revelation 8, which is a uh, judgment passage at the end of the day, a forerunner judgment passage. I know you know that. Okay, so I am so excited. So I know that this subject of Revelation 2.17, 3.12 and uh, Revelation 19, 12, the knowledge of God and who we are to God is critical. That's a massive subject that I'm only wanting to get this down. I only got a couple minutes left before the tape is over. But now it's two weeks later. It's two weeks later. It's Isaiah, it turned to Isaiah 63. This is my last uh, testimony. I'll just take a minute or two. Then I want Terry to come up and comment on it. Two weeks later. Here I'm sitting in that chair again. That old six hours, I loved it. It was my honeymoon time of the week. And I'm reading. I'm reading Isaiah. I always read Isaiah, 40 to 66, because the Lord told me my, man, well, uh, I read it even before that, actually. But he said, my, your, your mandate is in Isaiah chapter 40. That's, your, that's who you are. And I'm reading it. I'm Isaiah 63. Now, you'll notice Isaiah 63 is right after Isaiah 62. It's right after Hephzibah in verse 4. It's after Ihop in verse 6. And it's after forerunner ministry in verse 10. It, it's my life. And I'm on Isaiah 63. I don't really know Isaiah 63 at this time. You know, I've read it a, a few times, but it's kind of an odd passage. You know, who is this that comes from Edom with dyed garments from Basra, the one who's glorious in his apparel, traveling in the greatness of his strength? I who speak in righteous, it is me, mighty to save. And the question, why is your apparel red? Why are your garments like one treading in wine press? And the Lord answers, I have trodden the wine press alone from the nations or the peoples. No one was with me. I have trodden the wine press alone in my anger. I trampled in my fury. For their blood is on my garments. I have stained all my robes. Verse 4. Because the day of vengeance is in my heart. And he goes on to uh, on. Uh, verse 5, he says, in the middle, there was no one. There was no one. I wondered there was nobody that would stand with me. And my own fury sustained me, my zeal for righteousness. And I'm reading this. I'm going, whoa. You know, I've read it a few times over the years, but no real feeling about this passage. It's just that it's, you know, it's, it's, it's uh, unusual language. Here I am there. You know, it's, I'm doing that six-hour deal. And whatever, it's maybe nine or ten. And uh, that fire and wind comes on me again that hit me two weeks ago and 20 years ago. It's on me again. I go, oh, my goodness. Oh, my goodness. Met Kingsley Fletcher when he prophesied about IHOP in, in uh, January 99. And I'm going, uh-oh, what's happening? And the Lord begins to make known this passage to me as I'm reading it. Now, he, sh he speaks to me, and he says, Isaiah 63 is really just an overflow of Isaiah 6, verse 3. 6, verse 3 is developed in 63. And so I'm, I know I'm being led by the Holy Spirit. It's, and I know some of you can't even comprehend what this passage is about right now, and I can't take time to go through it. I'm just setting the genetics for our movements, what I'm really doing it. It's Jesus, the king, being, he's, he's wearing the red garments of a judge at the end of the age. That's what he's doing. He's walking through the nations. The reason his garments are red, he has crushed the nations like the man who crushes the grapes effortlessly in the wine press. He goes, I am mighty. I will deliver and I will use judgment. I will walk through nations and there will be blood everywhere and I will wear the red garment when I do this. And I'm there in the fire and the wind. And, and it says here in verse 1, who is this whose garment is glorious? And I begin to say, your red garment is glorious. Why is it red? A king should be white in his garments. Why is it red? And I was, and I knew it was judgment. I knew that the passage enough to know that. And I started by faith. Your garment, your red garment is glorious. And he's traveling up and down the highway. And of course, it's the highway of Isaiah 40, verse 3. It's the highway of the forerunner. And then he says this. This is where it really hits. And uh, Terry, why don't you come on up here and get ready to comment after this? Because I only got a, uh, just another paragraph or so. And uh, it's this word alone. Verse 3, I've trodden the wine press alone. 
And that's when the Spirit began to come on me. And the Lord says, there's no peoples, there's no nations, there's no nation in the earth that agrees with my judgment. There's no, there's no uh, uh, presidential cabinet on the earth that agrees with what I'm doing. They're all against what I'm doing. And I said, Lord, and he said, the body of Christ will be confused for a, for a season, and many for a long season. And so the Holy Spirit says this to me. You have preached Jesus in white. See that song of Solomon 5.10? He is dazzling. That's white. He is excellent. He goes, you've preached Jesus in white, the beautiful God, the dazzling God. Will you preach Jesus in red? Will you preach Jesus? The Holy Spirit's talking in red. And I say, yes. And he goes, for I will trample the nations alone. I can't get any nation to agree with me. Will you agree with me? And I'm going, yes. And the wind and the fire. And he says, you will be rejected even by my people. Some of them will rise up in confusion and reject you. And I make a promise to the Lord. I will preach the Jesus in the white garments, the beauty dazzling song of Solomon, and the Jesus in red. I will do this. I will do this. And then Terry comes over, taps me on the shoulder, and he says, Mike, I'm not going to do this every prayer meeting because he just did it two weeks ago. Although it was by a letter, he said, I have to. I mean, I have to. He says, my Bible is closed. It's been closed for a while. He doesn't know what I'm reading. Nobody sees it. I'm in a little corner. He says, I have to. He says, the same angel two weeks ago, it's fire and wind again. He goes, it is. It just is. I said, you're right. He said, he's not speaking this time about his name uh, and the way he did two weeks ago, he's telling me he's coming to you in red garments. He's telling me he's putting the mantle of Isaiah 63 on you. He goes, you need to study Isaiah 63. And I look up, I go, Terry, you have no understanding what is happening to me right now. He says, the Lord says this to you. Will you preach the Jesus in red, which is the Revelation 8 of the, of the two weeks before? So uh, uh, we're at the end, but uh, Terry, take some time. Take some time. Let's, let's uh, get Terry on plenty of time on a tape. We're at the end of my tape. We don't have to be at the end of your tape. Because I want you to take your time to talk about this. Amen. Well, I